Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about supernova. And supernovae are exploding stars, supermassive stars that are at the end of their life, and they go out with a bang. So let's see how they work, because we talked about uh, large stars and how they lived last time, and we found that they actually don't live as long a lifespan as low-mass stars. So let's see what the big, one, the big boys do. So the endpoints of various stars of solar mass levels uh, can be is kind of summarized here. This comes from one of the Pearson type textbooks. And if it's really small, less than 8% the mass of the sun, it does not do anything dramatic. It, be, it becomes, they're, they're brown dwarfs. And they basically do not, uh, they never initiate hydrogen fusion. Between about 8% of the mass of the sun, about a quarter of the mass of the sun, the final end state would be a star that has completely converted itself from hydrogen into helium, and it becomes a helium white dwarf. Somewhere between, say, about a quarter of the mass of the sun and about eight, uh, four to eight times the mass of the sun, this, this table I think is a little bit old, uh, the star ends up as a white dwarf, a carbon-oxygen white dwarf, and if it's much, much larger than about four to eight times the mass of the sun, about 12 times the mass of the sun, at the time of main sequence burning. Then it'll end up with a neon oxygen white dwarf. And if it's larger than that, with 12 solar masses, you get a supernova. And a supernova doesn't produce a planetary nebula or a white dwarf. It produces something completely different. So let's see what that looks like. Last time we talked about the last days of a supermassive star, and where we ended it with, where massive stars go through these in huge, 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 fast burning. Uh, burning now means fusing hydrogen into helium or some element into another element to liberate energy. And very massive stars, roughly at least eight to ten times, at least ten times the mass of the sun, they burn hydrogen into helium for only about ten million years, a very short time period compared to the sun's ten billion year rough life span, which is about a thousand times longer. And once they do that, they only burn helium for about a, a one million years, uh, co convert carbon into oxygen and neon for only a thousand years, convert fuse neon into oxygen for only about 10 years, oxygen into silicon only for about a year, and then the final stage of burning silicon into nickel and iron only lasts a day. Now this means that down in the core of this nested onion skin sort of thing, way down in the core, a very, very large inert iron and nickel core is building up rapidly and compressing um, uh, and starting to do a major compression as it's not producing any, any energies, but it does release energy by compressing. So it's releasing some of its heat by simply uh, releasing it through gravitational compression. And that's what the iron core is doing. So at the end of this day, there's, a high, there's all this shell burning, and we've seen burning again here means fusion. Hydrogen fusion, helium fusion, carbon, night, neon, oxygen, silicon, and, and fusion all the way down into the core. The exterior of the star is now extraordinarily massive. It's a red supergiant or a red giant or maybe even a blue supergiant, but it's definitely a supergiant star. And the size of the star now has expanded out to about five astronomical units or almost the orbit of Jupiter or larger. But the core is extraordinarily compact and that's where all the action is. The outer envelope is just primarily hydrogen and helium. Uh, but there's practically no mixing between the outer port, the outer envelope, and the inner core. So we have a really now we have a touchstone that we have to actually understand for what's going to happen next. And what we've really been talking about the entire time is how much energy is liberated by combining uh, uh, nuclei together, and that's what we call the binding energy per nucleon. And this graph, which is uh, which is comes from data that I downloaded from the International Nuclear Structure and Decay Data Network, which is a subdivision of the Internet, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, which governs, uh, which which tries to help people not explode nuclear weapons in various countries and so forth. That's one of the things they do. Anyway, they do have a very fascinating set of data about the nature of atomic energy and nuclear energy. And so I downloaded all the data and find, found how the binding energy per nucleon is in mega electron volts, which is a little tiny amount of energy, but in terms of nuclei, it's pretty large.
The number of nucleons on the bottom shows how many protons and neutrons there are in the nucleus. So those are the nucleons we're talking about, protons and neutrons. And notice the graph has a peak right around 50 or 60, right? Just north of 55 or 60. And there's some other residual peaks off to the right, and there's a big drop off to the left. Everything that we've been talking about with those little stars up to this main sequence stars takes tiny nuclei, which would be on the lower left with the number of nucleons, one is hydrogen, which is a proton, and the number of nucleons builds from one up to four. And in fact, I'm just going to move my mouse across and show you where helium is. And right there where I put my, new, where I put my helium, where I put this on there, that is helium. Helium nuclei are incredibly well bound. So if you put helium to get hydrogen together to helium, you get a big jump. So there's an enormous, enormous jump that happens when you bind hydrogen into helium. All right, so this graph shows how much energy is liberated when you put all these protons and neutrons that, that into a nucleus, or how much energy you have to provide to the nucleus to tear them apart. So it's interesting to note that this, this graph has a peak, and it, it drops off to the right for very, very large nuclei, and it drops off to the left for very small nuclei. So this means that we will have what's called a nuclear impasse. The fusion of light in elements, anything less than iron, gives off energy due to fusion. So we see in this graph below that, that hydrogen, or H1, which is just a proton, gives off energy by fusing hydrogen to deuterium, H2, which we see down below. And that's what we've, we've known that, though, since we talked about the proton-proton chain. And we also knew that hydrogen fusing to helium gives off a lot of energy, because there you see HE4 in this graph. And that gives off energy. We also know that fusing helium into carbon gives off energy, but not as much. See the difference in energy between helium-4 and carbon-12? It's not as much as the difference between hydrogen-1 and helium-4. There's a, a large amount of energy that's given off by fusing hydrogen-helium, but not as much from helium to carbon. And the step is even smaller from carbon to oxygen. In fact, if you look, you can see that as you go up and up and up to the peak at iron-56, that each step is progressively smaller. You get less and less and less energy out of the reaction by combining something with carbon, carbon-12, combining it with a helium nucleus to form oxygen-16. You don't get as much energy. In fact, the energy difference to get it from oxygen-16 to iron-56 is very small. So therefore, there's less. this is what we were talking about in the last time, is the as it progresses, each successive step provides less and less and less energy output. It also takes more energy to do it because these things have protons and the protons push against each other for the electrostatic force. And so you get less and less energy out. The nuclei are bound less and less strongly, which means it takes less and less energy in order to rip them apart. And if you fuse high, but, but the general trend of this whole graph is that if you fuse elements lighter than heat iron together, you do get energy out. And if you have ener and to get elements heavier or more massive than iron with more nucleons in the nucleus of the of the nucleus, then it actually has less bound. So if you look at uranium two thirty eight, we have on the cross there, we have on the right hand side, we see that it has it is less bound than iron fifty six, meaning it has less binding energy per nucleon. And so just piling stuff on top of it doesn't mean it means it takes energy to put these things together in order to in order to actually create uranium 238. The uh, you don't liberate energy, you absorb energy in order to go there. So here it is again in larger form. We see that helium to carbon gives off energy because you go up. Carbon to oxygen gives energy because you go up and oxygen all the way up to neon and magnesium all the way up to nickel gives energy at up all the way up to iron 56. And below that, fusion gives off energy. But if you fuse elements together and try to go more massive than iron, it takes energy because the binding energy is less, so you have to push it together to keep it together. That's a better way of talking about it. In fact, another way to look at it is we use uranium in our uh, fission nuclear reactors in order to get electric power, and we get that, we get that power by uranium uh, de radioactively decaying down to lead, and that gives off energy. And so uranium decaying to lead, which is about halfway up, or more than halfway up that, 
from the far right hand side to the left towards the peak gives off energy. So above iron, fission gives off energy and to get of things more massive than iron, it, it takes energy. All right, so this is a more detailed view and it was poking around on the internet to try to find a little better view, but you know, this is not very clear. And I, what I did then is I decided to try to zoom in and show you what's really there, but it's really not clear. We've got iron 56 and nickel 58 at the top. We have strontium 6088 and uh, 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 scandium and cesium, and there's polonium, uh, lead 208 way down there. But these graphs are kind of hard to read. I'll grant that because you know they're low resolution on the internet. So again, I went back to the to the IAEA website and grab just that data to see what the most bound nuclei are. And we'll look at the top, 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 top peak. We see there's three, uh, three nuclei that are the most bound. And iron 56 is the leftmost of the three top ones. Nickel 58 is just a little bit more, more bound. And then there's nickel 62, which is also just a little bit more bound than nickel 58. So what you find then, but nickel 58 uh, is, I believe, radi is radioactive, so it's going to decay. And I and nickel 62 is also radioactive, so it will decay, and they'll decay rather rapidly. So even though they have a high binding energy, they have a high, they're also radioactive, so they fall apart. In any event, they, and also they take a lot more energy, and conditions tend to not be correct for them to actually stay together. So you have to have very different conditions, and we're going to see what those conditions are in the center of a star. Because iron 56 is the most is the most common element in the in the universe for a reason, and it's at the top of this peak. So anything below this peak, you get energy by fusing things from the left hand side of the peak up to the right hand side of the peak. And the typical fusion means take an element, take a nucleus, and either slam a proton into it or slam a helium nucleus into it. That tends to be the, the dominant reaction that you would do in order to do fusion. It, you sometimes have like two carbon nuclei slamming together and that falls apart and gives off stuff. But, tip, but it's very easy to say, let's get a helium nucleus because it's lighter than a carbon nucleus and spin it up really fast so it can smack into stuff. Be that as it may, however many, 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 many ways there can be, because each one of these dots is a separate nucleus. So there's lots of different nuclei, lots of different isotopes of various nuclei, but you get them by doing fusion or then radioactive decay by fission. All right, so what happens in the center of a star? In the center of the supermassive star, the iron core is going to grow and grow until by the, by the silicon fusion happening above it until the mass becomes about somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 solar masses. And then the core will collapse under its own mass because it exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit for a, uh, well, uh, yeah, it, it exceeds the limit that a white dwarf can have before it will explode. So a white dwarf is basically forming an electron degenerate core in there. It can't be supported by electron degeneracy. And all of a sudden the core collapses down rapidly and, and heats, up, uh, heats up amazingly. And it gets up to about 10 billion Kelvin, and the density is about 10 billion grams per cubic centimeter. So one sugar cube would weigh 10 million kilograms, or that roughly translates into a few hundred thousand tons. So we have a sugar cube weighing hundreds of thousands of tons. That's a lot of weight, and that's how dense the nuclei, the core becomes. However, even though it's that dense, it is still a gas because it is so incredibly hot. And way down in the center, it's incredibly turbulent because the star's core is rotating, and as it rotates, it spins everything around, and so you got all this crazy mixing happening. And even though the core is there, it's not not moving. It's the whole the star itself is spinning. Now, the, there, when it's that hot, the energy is primarily in the form of kinetic energy of the nuclei bouncing into each other, and that's at roughly the same temperature as the light. So there are gamma ray photons that can't go very far because the density is so incredibly high that they actually equalize the temperature with the material around them. So everything is the same temperature, both the light, the profile of the light and the black body spectrum, as well as the nuclei that are zipping around. And that has a number of results. Once you get enough of the energy in the form of light, then the light itself has enough energy in the form of a number of mega electron volts to actually disintegrate the nuclei. 
Remember those nuclei have binding energies of, nu of iron is roughly about eight or eight and a half or nine mega electron volts. And once the temperature of the center of the area exceeds about 10 billion Kelvin, which is really high, that's 10 billion, right? 10 billion. Once it exceeds that, then a significant fraction of the energy in, of the light actually has an energy on the order of a few, about 10 or so mega electron volts, which is a very high energy uh, gamma ray. So once these gamma rays go flying around, they can actually disintegrate the iron nuclei. And when the iron nuclei disintegrate, they absorb the energy of the light. And then that lifts the nucleus apart, giving the uh, constituents its energy. And that binding energy then is absorbed out of the system. And so as the entire store, as the nuclei now start to absorb the light and then break apart because of it, this is called photo disintegration, it removes the light and therefore removes the energy that supports it. It robs the core of energy. It robs the core of pressure because if it's hot, it has high pressure. Second, then the, the density continues to increase, and at this, because as everything's breaking apart, then there are, you have free neutrons and free protons. So as, the, as there's photo disintegration happening, it doesn't just break it into helium nuclei, it breaks it down into also protons and neutrons. That's very high energy light. And so now the protons and electrons are, in, are very close together. They can fuse together to form neutrons. And the neutrons then, of course, uh, give off neutrinos. And neutrinos carry a tiny amount of energy, and as they carry a tiny amount of energy, they escape, and they just leave, because neutrinos don't see anything. Remember, we talked about the surface of the sun, deep, deep, deep in the core of the sun, where neutrinos just escape. The reactions occur in the sun, and they don't even see anything. So the neutrinos get out of there, taking energy further away from the, from the core, leaving it with no energy. So there's no energy to provide pressure against gravity because remember gravity is always working. So the neutrinos escape, carrying away more energy to provide the pressure, and then it collapses catastrophically. So right around this, this only lasts about a day, this whole event. And once the iron core starts to collapse, it begins at about something roughly the size of the earth at a density of over, a, and the, the iron core collapses at, at, at about 100 million grams per cubic centimeter. And then a second later, this is almost free, it's faster than free fall. Actually, it is free fall given the gravitational pull that it is. In total free fall, it drops from 6,000 kilometers in size down to 50 kilometers in size in less than a second at about a quarter of a second in, later. And then the, the, uh, the density increases to almost 10 to the 14th grams per cubic centimeter, which is astonishingly high density. And that density is the same density as, the, as an atomic nucleus. So you can't really push the nuclei together anymore because now they're literally in contact. So the density raises in the core and, the con and it has to stop because now neutron degeneracy comes into play, just like we talk about electron degeneracy in the center of the sun. Uh, that, that causes the helium flash in low mass stars. But with neutron degeneracy, that then says, I, I'm a neutron. I can't go on top of another neutron. I can't go inside another neutron. We can be right together. We can be next to each other. We can, we can touch each other, but we can't be inside each other. So therefore, the neutrons don't have any place to go except stack up against each other, and they cannot compress anymore. So since they cannot compress, basically it talks, makes a bounce. So then you have an enormous bounce off the core because material still is piling down on top of it. The core is now collapsing down to about 2.5 times 10 to the 14th grams per cubic centimeter, which is the density of an atomic nucleus. And the strong nuclear force now comes into play, which, which does all sorts of weird things. Strong nuclear force is really poorly understood. But what it does is it actually says that now you have uh, gluons that are interact, doing the interaction between the protons and neutrons. And that interaction is very powerful and keeps the nuclei from going on top of each other. So the inner three quarters solar mass of the core, that just stops. So everything else starts to fall on top of it and it springs back a bit doing what's called a bounce. And so material still keeps falling on top of it, but now, now that core collapse is coming back up. And that creates a shock wave. That shock wave kicks out about 
a, a huge amount of energy, 10 to the 44th joules, which is the equivalent of about 100 billion suns. That all happens in less than a quarter of a second. And in, in about 20 to 40 milliseconds, which is the same time it takes you to blink your, snap your fingers, all the matter that is getting swept up by the shock wave gets, it, it, there's a bunch of stuff that's falling down on top and the shock wave's coming up and it stalls because now you've got material coming up and material coming down. You've got a shock wave above it. And then the interior of the core, because the neutrons are becoming, because protons and neutrons, protons and electrons are still becoming neutrons inside of that core as part of this compression. The neutrinos are still trying to get out and they can't so they basically create, they get trapped. Finally, it becomes dense enough for neutrinos to get trapped. And by trapped, I mean one out of every billion or so. The other 999 million uh, get out. But one in a billion, considering how many neutrinos are coming out, that's enough to do it. Those neutrinos get trapped in the gas. They then heat the gas, depositing their energy through, uh, through weak nuclear reactions inside of the gas. And that turns it because it's uneven across these across there because the neutrino uh, because neutrino interactions are rare, so it's going to be an uneven sort of uh, distribution. That leads to incredibly violent convection right above the core, which is trying to bubble away and turn itself into one big atomic nucleus. And that makes a new shock wave as the neutrinos now push the whole thing apart. About 300 milliseconds, about, which, is a, which is just over a quarter of a second, which is also interestingly enough, that's about as fast as your brain processes thoughts, 300 milliseconds. That's interesting to think. So as fast as your brain can process a thought, the shock wave reappears and smashes out through the star, pushing up against the infalling matter, creating a massive amounts of nuclear fusion in the wake because of the dense, the high density and high temperature. That shock that comes back up, which is now a shock wave or an explosion wave, heats and accelerates the rest of the star, and the shock eventually breaks out through the surface, moving at almost 10% of the speed of light. And from a distance, we see a star that's now about the size of Jupiter's orbit explode. And that's what we call a supernova. And for a very, very brief time, within minutes, a, a supernova can outlast up to 1 to 10 billion times the luminosity of the sun for just a few minutes, and in fact much longer, and it can outlast an entire galaxy of stars in terms of its output of light. And the outer envelope is then blown off into space along with much of the core and accelerated all, uh, to uh, a fraction of the speed of light. Remember, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So this is going 1 30th of the speed of light. That's pretty fast. And that's a really fast shock wave. It's not a pretty thing. If you were next to it, you'd be dead. It doesn't matter how close you are, you'd be dead. You can't be Superman, you'd be dead. If you were within a light year, you'd be dead. That's just how this all works out. And, well, you're not going to be there, and they're never going to do an episode of Star Trek, and I'm even sure Doctor Who would lose it on that one. Anyway, the gas will expand, eventually cooling off, leaving only the core behind. And we see in the background here a galaxy with ha that has a supernova in it, and we see the supernova on the outskirts of this galaxy. And notice how it's almost as bright as the core of the galaxy. This is a, real, this is a dimmer supernova. But it, was, uh, but it was seen around that galaxy. In fact, you could think it might, might even be brighter than the core. And remember, the core of the galaxy is composed of maybe tens of billions of stars itself. So one star is much brighter than maybe tens of billions, 50 billion stars that are deep in the core of this galaxy for just a few months. And that's what a supernova is. And this has a name 1994D because it was seen in 1994 and it was the fourth one observed in 1994. So that's why it's called Supernova 1994D. Then this was one that I saw in 2014. This, this happened in the nearby galaxy M82. It was a different kind of supernova, but still the point's the same. It was a super bright star, and that bright star appears inside of the, the disk of the galaxy. Don't look at the star that's right above the, number, the, the, the magnitude label. Look inside the disk, and you'll see that there is one star that's actually getting brighter and brighter with time and then fading with time. And so we, there, we see that as time goes on, this particular star is getting brighter and brighter and brighter and then fading. So the order of the images is upper right, middle right, lower right, upper left, middle left, 
lower left, which is kind of a weird organization for it. But what the heck, somebody was reading it that way. That's good for them. Uh, I forget why this image came about like that. But we definitely see the star getting brighter as time goes on. And that's that was in January of 2014. And I remember taking out a telescope into, into the park and, and actually going outside and seeing this supernova inside of that galaxy. I had a 15-inch scope at the time. And, uh, and when I looked at that thing, I could definitely see a line of three stars. I could see the, the, the two stars, and it's most obvious in the lower left-hand corner of this image, as well as the core of that galaxy. So this, is, this was eminently within the observational capacity of a, of a large, of a, like a foot, uh, a 15-inch telescope in an urban environment. I, I saw it. And there's another image. This was taken by a microobservatory, and we see all the way over on the right, and I'll just use my mouse to kind of point over to it. There it is right there. There's the supernova in M82. Here's another supernova in the galaxy NGC 1309, and there's a Hubble follow-up image with respect to it. This, this, the left-hand one by taken by the Lick Observatory was in 2002. And once you run out of letters, you start doing two letters. So they went through the entire alphabet, and that's because F and K. What, what does F and K mean? Well, there's been, since 1994, uh, serious supernova studies, so people are able to find large numbers of supernova by going and hunting for them. So dedicated supernova searches have been have found hundreds a year. And we see in the Hubble image from 2005, they're able to pinpoint exactly where that star was in the sky and try to find, look for remnants. And there's one that happened in 2005 in the nearby galaxy M51, which is the Whirlpool Nebula. And there's that galaxy we saw in 1994. And finally, let's look at the nature of what a supernova explosion kind of looks like. They're very, very, very luminous, and we talk about light curves. And that's why we have these images that we looked at before, is that how does the luminosity of such a star change with time? And there's two types, two general types. There are many, many, many subclassifications. But I'm just going to keep it with these two types because it makes it a little easier to understand because there's two principal versions of, of supernovae. And we're really only talking about one kind this time, which is called core collapse supernovae. And a core collapse supernovae is called a type 2 supernova. And that's the green line in the background. What you see is that there's an incredible brightening, and then it dims for a while, and then it has a plateau, a flat plateau for a while, where it stays at roughly the same brightness for a long time, maybe a month or so, and then dims again at kind of a curve, and then the curve changes shape again. Each one of those changes of curvature is a result of different material glowing. So the initial brilliance of the supernova will fade over time, and it's slow because all of the gamma rays, remember that supernova explosion uh, had all sorts of things mixing down right above the core, and that means there was a, number, a huge amount of nuclear fusion that occurred explosively in the core, and rather rapidly. So in that explosion, it created large numbers of radioactive elements, and is primarily radioactive nickel and radioactive cobalt. And the two curves actually are, the, we see that there is a decay of radioactive nickel to cobalt to gamma rays. Those gamma rays then illuminate the gas that surrounds the supernova and makes it glow because the, light, the gas it might be too thick to actually let the gamma rays come straight out. Um, but then the gamma rays themselves glow, I mean, not the gamma rays, the, the gas itself glows because it's been heated by the radioactive decay of nickel and cobalt. And so that's how we have these kind of plateaus and peaks as the, glow, as the radioactive decay, that, those peaks then plateau and then peak and then decay. And that's all because of the radioactive decay of those other things. The slow, nickel tends to be the thing that fades out more slowly at the top and cobalt is primarily responsible on the right. So there are also these two types of supernovae, not just their light curves, meaning one just gets bright and then slowly dims, where the where that's the type 1s. The type 2s have a slightly different appearance to them. Type 1s have no hydrogen line emission features, but type 2s do. And that makes sense that a type 2 supernova would have a lot of hydrogen line emission. Remember, hot hydrogen gas happens because it gets really hot, right? And so it'll, it'll, the, the, the atom gets ionized or excited and drops back down from excited states down through. So you get hydrogen emission lines in visible light. And so you should see that pinkish glow of hydrogen, or at least an emission line looking at the spectrum. 
That's because the outer five astronomical units of the star, or a significant fraction of the star, did not participate in the fusion down in the core. So it's still hydrogen. So type one, uh, type two supernovae have hydrogen emission lines, but strangely enough, type ones don't. So core collapse supernovae are the type twos. They do have significant uh, hydrogen absorption lines, but type ones don't which is really interesting. So let's look at one in particular, one of the more recent ones that came out that happened in, uh, when, I was, when I just got done with high school. So when I was in high school in 1986, I graduated and went off to college and started studying astronomy, and everybody all of a sudden started talking about Supernova 1987A, the first one in 1987, in February 23rd. And that happened in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and that's a and the Large Magellanic Cloud is a neighboring galaxy to the Milky Way. It orbits at about 100, 160 million light, 160,000 light years away. So, for a very short period of time, it was brighter than five billion suns, which is amazing. Finally, which would made this really important, it was we haven't had many Mil uh, Milky Way based supernovae, and the Large Magellanic Cloud is not part of the Milky Way. And uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud is outside the Milky Way, but we haven't seen many naked eye supernova since Kepler saw one in 1604. So this is the picture that was taken by the Anglo-Australian Observatory of Supernova 1987A. The right-hand side shows B4, and since it's in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and that's a close-by galaxy, this is an extraordinarily studied area. And because it's so well studied, there's lots of pictures, and people were able to determine exactly which star it was before it exploded. And there's the star. And we can see there's the Large Magellanic Cloud itself in the sky. It's a star forming region. It's a huge star factory. And from the uh, this is from uh, the, then we take a slightly different view of it from an emission line survey on the left hand side. And then we show where this location is in supernova in the Anglo Anglo Australian Observatory's image of it. And then we see a Hubble Space Telescope image of it being close up. And this was a, the, a, a, a star that exploded that had 20 solar masses. So here's some of the vital statistics for 1987A, which was a supermassive star. It has a funny name named after the guy who actually made a catalog of these large stars, these hot stars in that area. Large Magellanic Cloud, distance about 50,000 parsecs. And the type of star was a B-type star, a B-type supergiant. So it's not as hot as an O star, but it definitely is a hot blue star. And the size of the star before it exploded was about 50 times the radius of the sun. And the surface temperature was about uh, was 16,000 Kelvin. Remember, the sun is is 6,000 Kelvin. So the surface temperature wasn't as lo was just only a little bit hotter, only three times hotter than the surface of the sun. However, the core was a different matter. The luminosity of that star prior to its explosion was over 100,000 times the luminosity of the sun, and its mass was about 16 times the mass of the sun. Now, there was another really interesting thing that happened at this exact time that the star went off. A neutrino burst was detected. At that time, there were a number of neutrino observatories, and three of them actually detected it. And there were 19 anti-neutrinos, anti-electron neutrinos detected by the various uh, neutrino observatories across the world. The, uh, the Kamiokand Observatory, which is in Japan, observed 12 of those 19. And the energies of these neutrinos were about 20 mega electron volts. Remember the binding energy of the core of, the, of a typical of a nucleus is about eight or nine for iron nuclei. So these these um, these neutrinos were given almost three times the energy required in order to rip apart an atomic nucleus of iron, which is fascinating. So there was a huge amount of energy being pushed into neutrinos as the star was collapsing in the core. The nice, the thing that made it really interesting, and began what called, and this this star began the process of what's called neutrino astronomy, because they were detected three hours prior to the light of the star. The star was observed uh, at an, by an astronomer because it was up at night, and it was seen in the sky at night, uh, and he reported it the time he saw it, and he swung a small telescope over to take a picture of it uh, when it was observing down in down in Australia. I forget the name of the person, but under the 1987A website, you can certainly find it. On Wikipedia, you can certainly find out about it. But because the distance to it is 168, 
thousand light years. And because we detected 19 antineutrinos across the Earth, that meant because of how seldom and how rarely neutrinos interact with normal matter, there had to be 50 billion neutrinos coming from supernova 1987a arriving at Earth, at the Earth's distance from it, 168,000 light years away, 50 billion neutrinos per square centimeter. So hold out your thumbnail, that's about a per square centimeter, and at that moment, 50 billion neutrinos passed through that your thumb at that point from that one supernova. That meant the total number of neutrinos that was emitted from this explosion was about 10 to the 58th. That's a big amount of neutrinos. That's a one with 58 zeros after it. That's, I, I mean, I didn't even bother to write it out because, I mean, it'd be cute and everything, but who wants to do that on this thing? And the neutrino burst lasted about 10 seconds, which lends credence to the idea that the neutrinos get all bunched up. And there were actually two or three uh, waves of neutrinos that occurred. The total energy released in the neutrinos is about 10 to the 48th joules, which is about 10 to the, tw and the since the, if you add it up over 10 seconds, that's 10 to the 22nd lum times the luminosity of the sun. That's a lot of energy. In fact, 99%, more than 99% of all of the energy of supernova 1987a and all core collapse supernovae go out in the form of neutrinos. Neutrinos carry away almost all the energy. Sure, we can see it by de as a as a bright thing, but if we could look in neutrino, uh, if we had neutrino detecting eyes, we would be blinded because there would be too many neutrinos for us to see. And the neutrino, the luminosity of it was astonishing in terms of how much luminosity there was in in energy compared to the sun. That's a, a, so the peak visible luminosity, meaning how much light it emitted, was about only a measly four times ten to the twenty thirty third joules, which is only a hundred, which is only about ten million solar luminosities, which isn't much. So that's incredibly small compared to the neutrino luminosity. It's a tiny fraction. It's, remember, you t subtract uh, that's about 50, ten to the fifteenth times less luminosity in light than there was in neutrinos. Well, the material that got ejected got ejected really hard at 10 to the 7th meters per second. That's about 3% the speed of light. And about four solar masses of material got ejected from this supernova. And it imparted 10 to the 44th joules of energy. So the kinetic energy of the material is comparable, or at least it begins to be comparable, to the total energy released in neutrinos. So the kinetic energy is about uh, one hundredth of one percent of the neutrino energy. And they, just to give it a, 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 a reference frame, it became as bright as a three magnitude star. So that's, it was pretty bright, so if you were down there, you could say, hey, what's that new star in the sky? Because a third magnitude sky under dark sky conditions, and if, you're no, and if you know your night sky, you'd say, that's a new star. You would have noticed it. It is a distinctly noticeable star. It wasn't as bright as like minus two, like Venus or something, but it was as bright as one of the stars in the, uh, one of the belt stars in Orion. That's as bright as that or one of the brighter stars in, in bright constellations, such as those in uh, the Big Dipper. So it became pretty bright. It was definitely naked eye star. But remember, most of the energy was not in light, wasn't even in ejected material. Almost all of it was in the neutrinos. However, that doesn't stop people from looking at stuff. And what's really neat is the American Association of Variable Star Observers had a number of people who went and took a look. And what we see is this is the light curve from visual visual um, observations of supernova 1987a. And this is in the V magnitude. And we see people making abs uh, magnitude measurements over the course of time. And this can be downloaded from the AAVSO.org, and it shows that there were, it, it was caught before the peak occurred, then the peak occurred, and then it had a plateauish sort of long slope, and then it had another drop off. So the first peak, the, when it was observed, was the initial explosion, and then it got brighter as time went on because uh, uh, nickel 56, which is radioactive, decays to cobalt 56, and which is also radioactive. So the, the nickel has a very short half-life, and that's the first decay of the curve, and it got brighter because that stuff was seen. As, as, the, as the shroud of gas was revealed, it, it got brighter and brighter and brighter. 
So the first slope down is the dimming as the nickel 56 finally decays and, and becomes cobalt 56. Then that drops away. There's not much nickel 56 left. We've got a bunch of cobalt 56, and so we got this longer slow uh, slanted curve, and that shows it decaying to normal iron 56. So iron 56 is the most common thing in the universe because everything more massive than it, or at least many of the products that would be formed in supernovae, decay to, nickel, to iron 56. And then it kind of has a nice little curve at the bottom, and that's just the remaining gas and dust being heated by x-ray emission from residual things as well as shock heating from the ground. And it got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And once it got below magnitude 6, it was below naked eye view, and then people were using telescopic views all the time. So that's really interesting. And we see how long it takes for these things to go, and you can see that it was observed in February, and it was a big burst of observations right there, blah, 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 as people ran to their telescopes in order to make these strong observations. And if you look, went to the AAVSO website, you'd see how many people actually participated, which is a lot. So later on, we see images of the of rings surrounding supernova 1987A, and the bar shows the angular diameter according of the moon, which is 1 60th of the angular diameter of the moon, which is about one, uh, one, one half, of a, a half of an arc minute. So that that shows it's not very big in the sky, but at least it's noticeable in a small telescope. So when this was looked at, it was determined uh, by subsequent Hubble observations that this glowing ring has uh, it exists. These rings, uh, that really bright ring in the center, has there been there for about twenty thousand years before the star exploded. And when the and the X rays from this explosion energized all the gas, it's making it glow. And the, all these things, these blobs, are moving really fast. That blobby structure is moving at about 20 million miles an hour, and that creates a shock wave of material that slams into, and that shock wave of material heats it up and makes the material in the surrounding medium, the surrounding interstellar medium, glow. So there's the glowing material moving at millions, at tens of millions of miles an hour, slamming into the interstellar medium, and causing it to be hot and emit x-rays. And there's also these kind of interesting bubble shells as well, which are like light echoes. And we can see that the Hubble Space Telescope imagery from 1994 to 2003 shows the evolution of this ring. The initial ring was heated by, by x-ray emission, and then as time went on, the mater material from the supernova slammed into that hot ring and made it glow brighter. And there we see a detail. There we see a, a, a brighter detail showing the knots uh, of, ex, of hot gas that's been heated to uh, tens uh, to extraordinarily hot, uh, maybe tens of millions of degrees. It also emits an X-rays. And how did this actually come about? Uh, how did this? What's different about this? And we're going to go into this a little bit later too. But let's let's look at how supernova 1987A might have arisen and where those rings came from. Probably the star was a binary system. And the more massive star evolved first, became a red giant, uh, and as it, as it became a giant, it in, literally engulfed its close companion. So these two were incredibly close stars, and then the two stars, one star was got larger and larger, and that provided drag on the other star. Third, the two stars, the, that in so spinning, most of the star, the red giant, got pushed out into a spinny envelope to conserve angular momentum as one part merged and the other part expanded away. So then you have this ring that's been expanding away as the two stars now merge together into one. Then as they merge, you have basically something that's very similar to a, a protoplanetary disk like we saw in the interstellar medium stuff. And that's what the bipolar outflows of gas made, a, made this, made this ring-like structure in the bubbles above. Finally, then, there's a massive explosion that occurs, and that's the supernova that we saw, all in bright light. And then the ejecta start to move outward, and once they, the, the ejecta then from the supernova slams into the disk, it makes it glow and forms those beads. So there's the story of how people think it actually worked. And so you have all these knots of gas and dust. There's bipolar flows, meaning that's what that inner glow is about from the jets that occurred from the, from the supernova as the material flows outward. So there's some hot material sitting there. And yet this should have formed some sort of neutron star, a black hole, but it isn't seen yet. And it basically has not been revealed yet because the gas density might be too high. 
uh, it's, there's no reason to think that it's not there yet. It's just hidden for some reason. Maybe it got ejected and shot out to the left or something like that and left the entire area. But there should be some kind of disruption if it did that. And angular momentum would say that it'd probably be shooting off into the ring structure around it. Anyway, we see that there's a pretty interesting explanation for those fun ring structures of supernova 1987a, which was the nearest supernova to us since, uh, since 1604. And why we care about supernovae, and we're getting close to the end here, so bear with me, is because nucleosynthesis is where we get all of the elements in the cosmos. We start the universe with hydrogen and helium. The Big Bang made hydrogen and helium, but stars make everything else. They fuse hydrogen into the light elements up to iron and nickel, and they, they became, come in layers. And when a supernova explosion comes out, that releases nuclear fusion of the light elements up to iron and nickel. That explosive fusion does. And then there's all sorts of neutron-based reactions because of the dense area inside of the supernova explosion itself, and also the radioactive decay in the supernova remnant. That occurs and that creates all sorts of heavy elements up to 254 californium, uh, which is 254 nucleons in it, which is really rich in nucleons, uh, neutrons, and those things then decay rapidly to other things like lead or iron. Supernova explosions create all, nearly all of the heavy elements in nature. That's where they come from. The iron that you use in that is in your blood was formed in a star. The, the nickel that you pay the nickels, pay a piece of candy for at the nickel and dime store, that was made in the center of a star. The universe started out with about 75% hydrogen just, and just under 25% helium and little bits of lithium, boron, and beryllium, but, all, but nothing else. Every other element were fused in nuclear reactions inside of stars and all heavy elements above Heal, he, he, I mean, sorry, above iron are formed in supernova explosions of various kinds. So the 10 most abundant elements in the entire universe are hydrogen, helium, starting at the top, all the way down to sulfur and magnesium. And notice what's interesting about what we see in the top most 10 abundant elements is that many of them, like magnesium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, iron, those things are really important for life. So the elements that make up life are incredibly common elements in the cosmos, and they've, they're also small on the, on the periodic table. We also see silicon being a very large amount that was formed, and notice what the Earth's crust is made out of mostly, primarily silicon oxides, and so that, mean, that shows where planetary objects come from. So planets are made from silicon and iron, predominantly with all sorts of other stuff and carbon and oxygen, as, and life uses those common elements in, in huge amounts in order to, in order to metabolize and, and live. So what happens to that supernova remnant such as 1987a? Well, you get all sorts of the, all the materials that were made in that, all that fusion and rich stuff was made in the explosion. It expands at thousands of kilometers per second. That makes a blast wave. As we saw with 1987a, it plows into the interstellar medium. It stirs the interstellar medium. It makes an ionized nebula that can be seen for thousands of years. We'll talk about supernova remnants next time. But that makes something can be seen for a few thousand years after the explosion. And that material then mixes with the interstellar gas. That mixed gas makes, is, becomes part of the next generation of stars with these metals. And then the next stars are more metal rich. And by metal, I don't mean like iron and nickel and so forth. I mean any other element heavier than helium. That's what astronomers call metals. That's a really funny thing. So metals are things that are heavier than helium, and all successive stars have more of it as a result of that. So the material that was formed in those supernovas goes out into space, and all of the things that are us that were formed in some supernova long time ago in, in the same galaxy, and somewhere very nearby, because there would be stars such as, but slightly less massive stars emit a huge amount of carbon and oxygen before they decay. There's a different kind of star, but the vast majority of all heavy elements come from supernovas such as these. And therefore, the solar system itself 
formed five billion years ago by gas that was enriched from these massive star explosions. And so stars form, they evolve, they live, and they die. And then they push out that stuff into the interstellar medium and make more stars. And that's what we mean by this thing that we saw earlier on, that the beginning stars start from clouds of gas and dust. They form protostars. They go through their main sequence lifespan. They then become red giants or explode as supernova. If they become red giants, they puff off their outer layers as planetary nebula. The more massive red uh, stars, like a little bit more massive than the sun, churn out a lot of carbon before they do that. The most massive stars go into these core collapse supernovae and explode in wildly in order to make these type two supernovae. Sometimes they'll form a neutron star and sometimes they'll form a black hole. The most massive stars at the top of this thing uh, don't even can do can go straight to a black hole. And that's really interesting. And we'll talk about those when we talk about gamma ray bursts. But for now, notice the cloud on the left forms stars that are protostars and stars become that way and they shed their outer layers or explode or something like that and seed the right-hand side of this, which is more and more and more gas and dust. And that then loops around to the left with those small mass stars at the bottom and the high mass stars on the top, with 80% of all the stars in the Milky Way, just brown dwarfs and red dwarfs, with the rarest of things, the, the tiniest sliver of stars are become blue giants, blue supergiants, and, uh, and explode violently in these ways to make supernovae. All right, so that's uh, more about supernovae, and we'll be talking about their remnants next time.